Welcome sociology students. Today's class is going to be on theory and theorists. On our first slide here, from the top down, we have pictures of Marx, Weber, and then Durkheim. So today's learning objectives, the first thing we want to do today is to review some of the main concepts we learned last week. Um, and then as a student, you should be able to differentiate between the three main theoretical paradigms, those are structural functionalism, social conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism. Um, and then be able to demonstrate a basic knowledge about these three theories and the theorists associated with them, as well as some other primary um, class, mostly classical theorists within the field of sociology. Let's get started. Today, I think per share is define sociological imagination. Now we spent all of last week doing that, right? So can you do that again? Um, define sociology, what's a paradigm, a theory, what's macro level, what's micro level, and then um, which of these theories of symbolic interaction, structural functionalism, and social conflict are micro and which ones are macro? So as a quick review from last week as well, sociology is the scientific study of human society and often debunks commonly held beliefs, sometimes things that people consider to be common sense. Um, when you take on a sociological perspective, um, you're looking to understand society um, by framing it on a more macro level, what we'd say broader social context. Um, and then you should also remember the difference between basic and applied sociology that's going to come up today as we link those concepts with some of the theorists that um, we're going to be learning about today. So basic sociology is sociology for the purposes of adding to the knowledge base. For example, doing research and publishing into journals um, where other academics would use that information as a resource. And applied sociologists who also do um, basic sociology, basically analyzing society. Um, they may do their own research or they may be using the research of others uh, for the purposes of attempting to solve um, social problems. So uh, the NAACP is a good example of this. Okay, so let's get into the new stuff. A theory and a paradigm. So a theory is a general statement about how some parts of the world fit together and how they work. Whereas a paradigm is more of a general perspective about how those parts fit together and how they work. Um, theories, when you think about a theory, think blueprint, right? Theories are an explanation, of usually a detailed explanation of how facts are linked. And they're based on often lots of research and lots of data. So a good example of that would be gravity. Gravity is a theory, right? So you can think about a sociological theory as a blueprint for how the world fits together and how it works. Whereas a paradigm isn't so concrete. It's a little bit more um, loose. It's not as structured as a theory. Um, and it can often come prior to scientific research and theories. Think tinted lenses in a pair of glasses, right? So I'm wearing a pair of glasses. So, um, if you think about the three, we have three main theories within sociology, right? So and they're also paradigms, they're perspectives for how the world works. So a paradigm is this general perspective. So say I have a pair of blue tinted glasses, right? I put those tinted glasses on and I look around in the world and I say, okay, this is how the world looks and how it works. Take those off. I put on a pair of choose these um, dark gray tinted glasses. I look around and I give an explanation of how everything works, take those off and I put on maybe a pair of yellow tinted glasses. So what changed? The world didn't change. My perspective changes. So paradigm is kind of a lens for looking at the world and being able to explain how it works. Sociologists start with theory and end with theory. What does that mean? Well, 
we use theory to help us come up with our sociological questions that we do research on. We go through the entire research process and then we analyze the data using theory again. So we start with theory and we end with theory. Now, sociologists do um, research on two different levels, both on a macro level and a micro level. Oftentimes you see within other fields um, like psychology, they do a lot of their research on a micro level. So they're examining small scale patterns um, or individual interactions. Um, in sociology, we tend to focus more on the macro level. So that's the large scale patterns of society and the large scale interactions. So I gave you kind of a visual here, right? So we have a micro level perspective of a forest and we have a macro level perspective of a forest, right? So the micro level gives us details of the individual plants, the trees, their trunks, their leaves, that kind of thing. The macro level would give us an overview of all of the different trees within a forest and, um, and the different weather patterns that are affecting it, right? So large scale view, small scale view, macro level, micro level. So the first theorist we're talking about today is Auguste Comte. He's credited with being the founder of sociology or the father of sociology. And that's because he was a positivist. He said, he came up with the idea that, hmm, maybe we should apply the scientific method to social life. Then he promptly did what we consider to be armchair theory. He basically just came up with his own theories and ideas. He never conducted research. Um, and so we don't really use his theories today because they didn't stand the test of time because he didn't conduct scientific research, but he came up with the concept of using the scientific method to study social life. And for that reason, he's the founder, the father of sociology. He was also um, what we call a social reformist. A social reformist is a sociologist who believes that we should reform society that we should use sociology um, to help change and improve society as a whole. So the next theorist we're talking about is Herbert Spencer. Herbert Spencer um, came up with the theory who, that was largely credited to Darwin, and that theory is social Darwinism. Herbert Spencer was what we call a natural selection theorist. He believed that society moved in a form of like progressive positivistic movement. Um, in other words, from a lower form to a higher form or um, towards freedom and away from government control. Um, but he was definitely not a social reformist. He did not believe that sociologists should try to change society or guide society in a different direction because he thought it would naturally evolve in the appropriate direction. And he's also the one that coined the term survival of the fittest um, that Darwin later used. Darwin later used his um, theories and did actually apply scientific research, but Spencer himself did not apply scientific research. Um, and it's probably one of the reasons why he's kind of lost um, in the common history that people understand in terms of when they talk about natural selection or survival of the fittest. The next series we're going to talk about is Karl Marx. Uh, he is one of the three main theorists that we learn about in sociology, um, primarily because he's associated with class conflict. Class conflict is one of the three main theories or paradigms that um, we discuss and use within sociology. Essentially at the core of the theory of class conflict is that economic inequality is the central force for, for societal change, meaning that all of our change within society is based on our connection to the economy, our connection to what Marx called the mode of production, which means how 
wealth is created, how we produce our economy and society. And he believed that everything was connected to that, um, our perceptions of society and how society um, changes through time. And he believed that there were essentially two classes, um, what he called the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, and that those two classes are in direct conflict with each other in what he called antagonisms. The interests of the bourgeoisie and the interests of the proletariat are in direct contradiction with each other. What is best for the bourgeoisie, the elite, is really not good for the proletariat, the working class. What's best for the working class, the proletariat, um, is not in the best interest of the bourgeoisie. So a couple other names that we have that are more modern terms, elite and working class, the 1% and the 99%, that's our newest term, the haves and the have-nots. So the bourgeoisie are those who own the mode of production. It's not just people who are wealthy. It's people who don't work for a living. Their money works for them. The proletariat is everybody who works for a living who makes a wage. Whether your wage is $12 an hour or $4,000 an hour, Marx would have put you within the proletariat. Now, the petty bourgeoisie, those are like small business owners and they often align themselves with the bourgeoisie. Um, and the lumber proletariat are kind of beneath, um, from Marx's perspective, beneath the proletariat. So he put, you know, um, people who are not within the economic um, economy, who are not within the economy into the lump and proletariat. So drug addicts, um, people who have mental illness, that kind of stuff. He, he put them aside and he called them lump and proletariat. So what Marx believed was that essentially that people would have a class consciousness. They would know if they were bourgeoisie or proletariat and they would fight in their own best interest. And that because of that, that pretty readily the proletarians would realize that they were being oppressed and they would um, revolt against the bourgeoisie. Now that hasn't happened quite yet. Um, some could argue that the current um, economic climate might be that. However, we still have quite a few people who have a what we call a false class consciousness. Um, they align themselves with the bourgeoisie, um, even though they're technically proletarian. So, and by the way, if you notice the change, it's because it's been a couple of days. I got a new chair. That's my puppy. Um, and my house is only half done because um, we are in the middle of construction. We have no floor. The next um, theorist that we're going to talk about is Emile Durkheim, and he's associated, he's associated with structural functionalism. So this theory, also one of the three main theories, by the way, conflict, structural functionalism, and symbolic interaction are all the three main theories in society, and they have stood the test of time, meaning that these theories have been tested through research and data, facts and information, and continue to um, be upheld through that. So structural functionalism essentially says that society is more than the sum of its individuals, that we uh, work together, all of the sum of our parts within society to create a whole, and that is society. In other words, um, society existed before you were born, it still will exist after you pass away, um, even though you contribute to society, um, you are not, you yourself are not society. Society has a life of its own. The example that's often given for structural fun functionalism or the analogy that's given is the body. So we would compare a human body to um, society. And what Durkheim said was that you need all of the different parts of society for the society as a whole to be functional. That means that you, if you compare it to your body, um, if you lose a, even a pinky or a toe or you lose an eye, the body as the whole then becomes less functional or not functional um, 
for that completeness, right? Or lack of completeness. And he believed that we had something that we call a collective consciousness. So collective consciousness is a shared way of thinking. This is the we, right? So you, you know um, that society may have a shared understanding or way of thinking, even if you disagree with that shared way of thinking. So it's not necessarily common sense. Think of it more as a sense in common, right? That makes more sense. That, that seems more appropriate to what he meant in terms of a collective consciousness. And he believed that we would all be socially integrated into our society um, through generally um, economics, through our job, right? Um, and that if you were not integrated into your society, you had what was called anomie or normlessness. And that's a lack of integration into society. Um, and when you don't have people integrated into society appropriately, the society as a whole becomes less functional. So from Durkheim's perspective, you need everybody from doctors and lawyers and politicians to trash men and um, people who do street sweeping and people who um, work fast food in order for the society as a whole to be functional. In addition to that, something doesn't have to be functional for the individual to be functional for society. Now, what does that mean? Well, say for example, um, something happens to you. You um, are mugged by somebody and that is not functional for your life. It's not functional for you personally but everybody comes together against that person who mugged you. We put them in jail and we all collectively understand that that's not an action that as a society we're going to accept. So we become more socially integrated into our society. Um, our society becomes more functional. Did your life become more functional after you were mugged? No. It's not necessarily functional for you, but that was functional for the society. It reiterated the boundaries of our society and what we find to be appropriate. Now, I'm trying to shorten Marx and Durkheim. I could go on for an hour for both of these, um, but I'm trying to keep it to the very basics of it. And we will um, touch upon Marx and Durkheim and these theories again. The next theorist that we're going to talk about is Max Weber. It's a German name, so it's spelled Weber, but it's pronounced Weber. Um, and what he believed was that we should have what we call um, a value-free soci uh, sociology. So his theories focus on um, unbiased scientific method, or at least some of his theories do. Now, these guys were all kind of around the same time, as you can tell. So they know each other's work. They're reading each other. They're sometimes even talking to each other. Um, so Weber, he believes that researchers' values and opinions should be neutral. And this is something that we still hold today. When we do science, we're supposed to be unbiased or neutral. And his way of doing that was that he said, um, you should take an ideal type from uh, whatever you're going to study and then compare the real world scenarios to that ideal type. And that's a way of being unbiased or neutral in your scientific method. Um, we don't necessarily use that um, today, but it's, it is an interesting concept and it's kind of interesting to try to do as well um, and read about in his theories. Now, he disagreed with Karl Marx. He says that religion was the central force for social change, where Karl Marx says that economics, our connection to the mode of production, is the central force for central change and uh, for social change. So he, Weber actually thought that religion was the origin of capitalism. This goes back to his Protestant roots. He believed that um, because Protestants as a whole saved their money, um, invested 
that that's the origin of capitalism, whereas Marx believed that it's your connection to how you um, make your living in society. So if we want to talk about who's macro and who's micro, Karl Marx is macro, Durkheim is macro, and Weber is questionable, right? So when he talks about the scientific method, that's pretty macro, but some of his theories are fairly micro. So we get his theories and paradigms kind of cover both macro and micro. The next theorist is um, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and he is also one of our leading theorists, founders in sociology. And he wrote this book called The Souls of Black, Black Folk. And it's supposed to be um, an, ethno an ethnography. So it's called a down-to-earth sociology, meaning he lived with and practiced. Um, instead of just doing research from afar, he included himself within the community to do the research and to write the book. And mostly he worked on race relations. Now, he got his um, PhD from Harvard um, at a time when black men still couldn't even stay in the same hotels as the white theorists as they were having conferences. He was actually the first black male sociologist to get a PhD from Harvard. Um, and he's one of our co-founders of the NAACP. He's a social reformist. He believed that we should do sociology to help improve society, to improve it towards um, something that was more equal for everybody in terms of race relations. So what does um, his theory essentially say? So in The Souls of Black Folk, what he says is that um, Black men in particular have a double consciousness. They understand what it means to be white in America, and they understand what it means to be black in America. And that's a very interesting concept because we see the relevance today, right? Where we can take this idea of what it means to be oppressed in America, and we can understand oppression in America if we're oppressed. But when we are the privileged group, there is oftentimes a very difficult um, connection that people are not able to make in what it means to be oppressed in a way that they are not oppressed. It is invisible to them. In other words, when you have privilege in a particular way, that type of oppression becomes invisible to you. But when you're oppressed, you see both the oppression and the privilege. Um, a way that you can personalize this and think about it, um, the double consciousness, is that you can, if you are a female, you can think of, of understanding what it means to be both female and male in society. If you um, are not of the Christian, Protestant, evangelical groups, you can think of what it means to be your religion within a society that is dominated by that particular type of Christian, Protestant, evangelical type of groups. Um, you would understand both, right? Um, if you are not able-bodied, you understand what it means to not be able-bodied in our society, but also to be able-bodied. You can see the privilege. So I'm just going through a few of those examples. Religion, able-bodiedness, sex, sexuality. Um, there's many more, but you get the point. By the way, he's a social reformist. Forget that. Another social reformist is Jane Addams. Now, she's also a co-founder of the NAACP. She also co-founded the American Civil Liberties Union, and her focus was on to the exploits of workers, and um, child labor laws, that kind of thing. So she's the one responsible um, for a lot of the unionization theories, right? So because of her, we have things like anti-child labor, that's because of unions, the eight-hour workday, that's because of unions, all of those types of things. 
Um, so Jane Addams, again, was a social reformist. She did, she did theory or she did sociology because she believed that we should change society for the better. Our next theorist is also a social reformist and she's also female. So if you've noticed our black male and two females are the social reformists, meaning they believed you should do research to change society for the better. So Harriet Martineau is a little bit prior in time to Du Bois and um, Jane Addams. And so she was actually an abolitionist um, as a social reformist, reformist, and she did international comparative studies, meaning um, she brings to us the theory of ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism essentially states that you have the habit of looking at um, everything through a cultural lens, through your own lens of your culture. So you have the idea of looking at it, whether it's right or wrong, um, based on your cultural lens. So it shapes your perspective um, about what you're looking at. You, you know, you can be ethnocentric on a macro level um, and on a micro level. So on a micro level, some kind of fun, interesting ways in which we can be ethnocentric, um, the way that you think that you should live within your household. Now, being ethnocentric is not necessarily all bad or all good. It has positive and negative uh, consequences or functions, what we would call positive and negative um, manifest and latent functions. And what that means is that uh, for example, if you're on a micro level ethnocentric, you tend to think that a, a household should be run the way that other people in your household think it should be run. So you tend to get along with people who you've lived with your whole life, your family, um, because you have the same beliefs about the way a home should be kept, the way you should act within your home, that type of thing. If any of you have ever lived with a roommate, you've encountered this, right, where it becomes non-functional. So little things, should butter be left out or be put in the fridge? Should you do dishes as soon as you're done or can you leave it out? Um, is it acceptable to leave food on the table and go on vacation? Like that kind of thing. Um, you would probably disagree with somebody who, you know, lives there in within their household in a different way, but you tend to agree with and get along with people like your family who tend to do things in the same way. Now, within your household, that's not a big deal. On a macro level, society level, when we we're talking about one country to another, this can have pretty dire consequences, right? So we tend to agree with other Western thinkers as Westerners um, in terms of society and, and how our economics should be run, how politics should be run, right? We believe in capitalism. We believe um, in, in our society, we tend to be Protestant Christians. Um, these beliefs can make you tend to think that somebody who looks different from the outside, say on the other side of the world, that they're quote unquote doing things wrong, right? Your cultural lens can mean that you tend to be more critical um, and can put that other group or society into a bad light. Their religious values aren't correct. Their societal values are not correct. They're not using the correct economic uh, means, mode of production. Okay? Um, so that's ethnocentrism. On a macro level, that can be very dangerous because it can lead to war, uh, it can lead to uh, mass conflict within or between two societal groups. The next theorist is C. Wright Mills, and he was also a reformed sociologist. Um, he's probably the most recent. Um, so he was born in 1956. I think he passed away recently. I haven't updated um, in terms of that. I have to double check it. 
but he did an analysis of the role of power elite. In other words, he was analyzing elites within our society. This is something sociologists have not had a lot of opportunity to do. People who are poor and disadvantaged, it's easier to access those people to do research on, but people who are extremely privileged and elite, these people are hard to access and to do research on because we don't have access to them, or at least accurate access to them. And what he said was that um, democracy is a fiction and that essentially democracy is controlled by a few people, um, not by the masses of people through voting, but by top executives from powerful companies, the executive branch of the government and top military officers. Um, so that these are the elites. Marx, when he, when he talks about people being elite, he's not talking about, um, he's not talking about it in the way that you might commonly be hearing about it in the news. Elites are people who control the mode of production. They're not people who are privileged through knowledge or who are professors, who work within academia, right? The elite are people who own the mode of production. They own how money is made and therefore can influence the masses of people. And so in this way, C. Wright Mills is essentially adopting that theory and continuing on with it. Um, and he says that those, those elites um, coupled with the um, executive branch of the government and top military officers are the ones that have enough power to elicit enough change within society to be able to sway things in a way that is in their best interest. And it doesn't have to be in the best interest of um, the masses of people. And he brings to us the theory of sociological imagination. And this is a theory we should know pretty well by this point. Um, so you can blame him, I guess, um, if you didn't like doing that theory first. But it's really important sociological imagination. It's the ability to understand society without putting your personal interests within it, right? To understand how society works outside of yourself. Um, and then putting in yourself and how you are impacted by society or how you could potentially impact society. Um, so he connects the macro to the micro, um, but his, his theory of sociological imagination is at the core of what sociology is. The next guy who I expect everybody to always get right on my test because he shares my last name is George Herbert Mead. Um, and he is the person who brings to us mind, self, and society. He's our micro level theorist, right? So Marx is macro, Durkheim's macro, Mead is micro, and he brings us the theory of symbolic interaction. And that's how does society shape people and how do people shape society? We are constantly impacting society by our everyday interactions and society constantly shapes us through those other individual interactions. So a good example of this could be um, the way that we drive in California versus in other places. So here in California, if somebody turns on their blinker, what do you do? You hit the gas, you rush forward, you try to get ahead of them. But if you simply leave California, if you turn on your blinker, lo and behold, people will slow down and let you in. So why is it different in Orange County, LA, and in California? It's different because people speed up when they see a blinker. We don't let people in. And so when you see a blinker, you do the same. How has how is your behavior being shaped? It's being shaped by the behavior of everybody around you. So that becomes the norm. When you leave California, the norm is when somebody puts their blinker indicator on to turn, you let them in. By the way, technically what you're supposed to do. Um, but in California, we shake our heads at that. We would probably never do that 
or if somebody does do it, you don't even actually expect them to let you in, so you're actually a little bit confused. That's what we mean by symbolic interaction. How you behave shapes society and how society behaves shapes you. So what did we learn today? We learned the theory of the paradigm. I'm sorry, we learned the concept of a paradigm, a theory, macro and micro, who's macro and who is micro, symbolic interaction is theory, that's our micro one, right? How you behave shapes society and how society behaves shapes you, Structural, structural functionalism, macro level theory. Society is more than the sum of its parts. Society as a whole can be functional, while things within society are not necessarily functional for society. So maybe it's not functional for you to have a below a living wage to be working in this type of job, but from Durkheim's perspective, that's functional for society because some people have to have jobs um, that nobody wants maybe, or that are below a living wage. Social conflict theory, also macro level from Marx, essentially that we're in conflict with each other, that you are either have or have not bourgeoisie or proletariat, elite or working class, and that your connection to society is based on your connection to the mode of production, how you make your living within society. The interests of the elite are in direct contrast with the interest of the working class. Hopefully, if you're working class, you have what we call a class consciousness and you're aware that you're working class so that you can vote and fight for the interests of the working class. You don't accidentally vote and fight for the interests of the bourgeoisie. Okay. What's a social reformer and which sociologists are considered social reformers? And here are your study questions for the week. You can choose any two, go into your discussion board or into this discussion board, right, where the lecture is, and just simply answer them. You don't have to coordinate with your group mates. Just answer two and then come back on Thursday when it's due and make sure you've left at least two comments um, I'd like you to do it before Thursday, but I understand if you don't do it until then. Um, just pick two, post the answers and the questions, come back a little bit later and discuss what people have posted. It's great when you overlap because then it makes it easier um, to leave comments.